Be thou my vision, O Lord of my In this episode of Word and Sword, we have five segments for you. First, we dive into a New Testament study on the Mount of Transfiguration and note a few lessons, including one about the relationships of the Old and New Testaments. Next, we study the church, namely the organization of the church as revealed in God's Word. In this study, we will see how radically different modern churches are from what the Bible states. In our third segment, we answer a viewer question. Is salvation by an experience? To answer this question, we examine Acts 9 and the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. A look at elementary principles and the laying on of hands is our fourth subject. It is one that is widely confused in the religious world of our time, but an issue the Bible states is a fundamental doctrine, and we hope to bring clarity in our study of it. Our last segment will focus on a lesson from history from Daniel chapter 2. In that chapter, Daniel interprets the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar, a dream that revealed the future. This study reinforces our confidence in God's control of the world. The Apostle Peter records that he was an eyewitness of the majesty of Jesus Christ. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 to 18, he said, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So Jesus is being seen here in all of his glory. In other words, his deity shown forth on this occasion. Of course, this occasion is a reference back to the Mount of Transfiguration. We want to look for a few moments in our study now at the Mount of Transfiguration, and we will look mainly in Luke chapter 9. But before we go there, we want to look in Matthew 16, which is a parallel account. In fact, the Mount of Transfiguration is recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and each of them give a little different detail in their accounts, but of course, they all harmonize together. But for the background of what's leading up to this Mount of Transfiguration, we want to look in Matthew chapter 16, and notice beginning here, verses 13 down through 20, where Jesus asked the apostles who men said he was. That is, what did they think about him? And they go down through some of the things they say. You know, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And Jesus then turned the question on the disciples and asked them, well, who do you say that I am? And this is when Peter makes that great confession that he believed, and the other disciples, of course, believed, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, when he made that confession, the Lord pointed out to Peter that flesh and blood had not revealed this to him. Peter did not find out that Jesus was divine because of what men were saying about him, because these other people saying, well, you know, Jesus is someone great, because those men did not understand who he was, but God understood who he was, and God was giving the evidence that Jesus was divine, not just some great prophet, not just some great leader of God's people, but he was in fact the divine son of God. And that's what Peter's confessing here. And Jesus says, you found that out from the father. One, because of John's testimony of John going before Jesus and testifying as to who he was, but really more to the point of them witnessing the miracles of Christ. In fact, it wasn't long before this that Jesus had fed thousands of people with just a little bit of food. So these disciples have been with him for some time. They've seen a lot of different miracles that he's performed, and that evidence has led them to the conclusion Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, they did not have the full comprehension of what that really meant at this time, but their their concept of him is growing and it's becoming more clear over time. 
Well, now, Jesus dropped something on these disciples that it was hard for them to listen to. They just couldn't believe what he was saying. In Matthew 16, verse 21, beginning, says, From that time Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, for you are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. So here Peter objects to Jesus talking about his pending death. Jesus laid that out to them. He's going to go up. He's going to suffer. He is going to be put to death, but he's going to rise from the dead. But Peter says, no, Lord, I'm not going to let that happen to you. So the Lord rebukes him because that's the wrong concept of the Messiah. He then goes on to make this statement, which is connected to what just unfolded in verse 24 of Matthew 16. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone comes, desires to come to me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And when he says, take up your cross, he's pointing out the kingdom is about sacrifice, sacrificing yourself, submitting yourself to the will of God and suffering the consequences for doing that. The kingdom is not based on military might or political power. It would not be established on that. It would not be advanced by that. But that's the concept the disciples had. And Jesus is trying to clear them up on that. That's not the way the kingdom's going to be. But you're going to have to take up your cross, just like I'm going to take up my cross and give my life. I'm not going to lead a military into Jerusalem and take over and then go and take over Rome. But rather, he would give his life as a sacrifice. That's the power of the kingdom is the sacrifice of the Son of God. And so he's pointing out to them, that's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to follow in my footsteps. So they have this concept of Jesus as being the Son of the living God, but they have a misconception and a lack of understanding about the nature of his kingdom and really fully and truly who he is. So following up on this is the Mount of Transfiguration, the events that unfold there that help to give a deeper understanding and a deeper conviction to his disciples about really who he is. And there are three disciples in particular that Jesus takes with him up there. And this is Peter, James, and John, his inner circle, and they're privileged to see these events unfold. So let's read about this Mount of Transfiguration over in Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 28, and the account here goes down through verse 36. So Luke 29, or rather Luke 9, 28 through 36. Now it came to pass about eight days after these sayings that he took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered, and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter with and those with him were heavy in sleep, and when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Then it happened as they were parting from him that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were fearful as they entered the cloud. A voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. When the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone. But they kept quiet and told no one in those days any of the things they had seen. So let's just look at this account before we begin to draw lessons out. First of all, it talks about Jesus goes up to a mountain to pray. Some of the accounts talk about a high mountain. Some people believe this was Mount Hermon that he went up on to pray. But notice the fact that Jesus, who's the divine son of God, is going 
to spend time in prayer. And this just shows us that he had a desire and a need, really, to have communion with the Father, to spend time with him. And this goes beyond setting the example for the disciples, but he really needed this communion and this comfort from the Father. And while he is up there and praying, it tells us that he was transfigured. And Matthew's account says that his face shone like the sun. It also talks about his clothes being white as light and like snow. In Mark's account, in Mark chapter 9, verse 3, it says that his clothes became so white like no launderer on earth could get them. So his clothes are very bright, very shining. In fact, here in Luke chapter 9, it said in verse 29 that his robe became white and glistening. And what an amazing sight that would have been when we read this. We, we get some idea of what it was, but it's certainly not like being there in person, seeing what Peter and John and James saw on this occasion. But if we just sit and imagine for a moment of the great grandeur, really the majesty, as Peter described in Second Peter 1, of Jesus Christ, what an amazing thing. This is one of those accounts where if I could sort of pick a few, a handful of occasions to be present in the Bible, this is one of those that I would have want to have witnessed, to be there, to see in person. But it tells us as this is happening, as he is being transfigured and his true nature is, is shining forth, if you will, that he's talking with two men and those two men are Moses and Elijah. Now, the question is, when Peter begins to make mention of this, that we'll make a tabernacle for you, for Moses, for Elijah. How does Peter know? There's no pictures of these men. There's no paintings of these men. And it's not like Peter had ever met Moses or Elijah before because they had been long dead. But what was happening evidently as Jesus is talking to Moses and Elijah Maybe they're using their names and calling each other by name. And that's how they know that this is Moses and Elijah. But just an interesting thing to think about. But as they're having this discussion, talking, it says in verse 31 that they spoke of his decease, that is Jesus' decease, his death, which was about to be accomplished at Jerusalem. So, He's getting closer and closer to the time when he would be put on trial, when he would be abused, when he would be executed. And that's why he's up on this mountain. He's gone up to pray to seek comfort and strength and encouragement in prayer because of this stressful situation he's entering into, this great trial he's about to face. And these two men are able to help him in part because they face suffering as men of God in their life. And so they're there to provide some measure of comfort to the Lord. And this is when Peter then speaks up and says, you know, it's good for us to be here because we can make a tabernacle for each one of you. Now, this was done as Moses and Elijah were departing in it tells us that Peter and James and John had fallen asleep. They didn't know really what to say. They're kind of startled about what's happening here, what they're witnessing. And this idea of building a tabernacle for each of them is the idea that he wants to honor each of them and really honor them equally. A tabernacle for you, for Moses, and for Elijah. And it's at this point that this cloud comes and overshadows them. Just imagine being enveloped in a cloud like a, a very thick fog or something that comes and overshadows them is hanging over them. And a voice comes from the cloud and Peter, remember, said in Second Peter chapter 1 that this was God the Father giving testimony about Jesus of Nazareth. And that voice said, this is my beloved son, hear him. In other accounts and in Peter's record later, he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, hear him. So this is God giving more evidence that Jesus is the divine son of God. And when the cloud disappears, when the cloud goes away, the only one left there is Jesus with his disciples. Now, let's make a few applications, draw some lessons out of the account of the Mount of Transfiguration. The first one that we want to make is there is life after death. 
When you look at Luke chapter 9 and see here where it says in verse 30, and behold, two men talked with him who were Moses and Elijah. We understand that Moses died about 1400 years before Jesus was born into this world and Elijah died, it was taken up rather, in a whirlwind about 850 years before he was born into this world. So these men had been gone for centuries, and yet it says here they are speaking to him. In other words, they had left this world, but they existed in another world. There's life after death, or there's life in another world. And of course, Jesus talked about life after death. In fact, he talked quite a bit about it. If you remember in Luke chapter 16, he tells the account of the rich man and Lazarus. Now, some people say that this is a parable. Uh, It's not presented like other parables are. And so I take this account to be an actual event or an actual thing that happened and Jesus is telling about it. But even if it is a parable, parables take something that is known, something that is real or based in this world or in reality, if you will, to teach a spiritual lesson. So he's talking about things that are factual, things that are reality in Luke chapter 16, as he tells us about the rich man and Lazarus. But we won't read this whole account, but we'll just make note of this, that it talks about that there is this rich man who lived a sumptuous life. And then there was this beggar who was full of sores, who just simply wanted the crumbs from the rich man's table and he was laid at his gate to receive the, you know, just the crumbs from the table. Well, it tells us that the beggar or Lazarus died and he was taken by angels into Abraham's bosom. He's led over into the next world, into the Hadean world, and he there joins the redeemed of God, which included Abraham. And it talks about the rich man died also and he was buried. And the next place we find the rich man is he's in torments. So, There's this Hadean world where on one side is a place of comfort and rest with the redeemed of God's people. On the other side are people who weren't faithful to God in this life, and they're suffering over on that side. So it's just pointing out to us, and Jesus just taught about the fact that when we die, we don't cease to exist. No, we still exist. Now, our bodies are left here. But our soul goes into the next world and we are going to end up either in a place of rest or a place of torment. And the account of rich man and Lazarus goes on to say there's no changing that. There, there's no ability to cross over from one side to the other because there's this great gulf that separates. And essentially what the Bible teaches in this is that when we die before the Lord returns, we're going to go over into the Hadean world to await the great resurrection day. And that's the next thing we want to get out of the Mount of Transfiguration. Now, let's go to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, this is the parallel account, and notice what is said here when Jesus and his disciples are coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration. They were up there. They had seen all these things unfold. They were overshadowed by the cloud, and they're returning and going down. And in Mark chapter 9 and verse 9, it says this, Now, as they came down from the mountain... He commanded them that they should tell no one the things they had seen till the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they witnessed all of this. They saw all these amazing things. And he says, don't tell anyone until I'm raised from the dead. Remember, before we read in Matthew 16, it's also recorded in Mark chapter 8, how Jesus began to teach his disciples in Mark 8, 31, that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. So Jesus taught them about the resurrection, and he tells them coming down from the mountain, don't tell anybody about what you've just witnessed until after I'm raised from the dead. Now, let's notice a fact, a a reality that hopefully gives us encouragement and comfort. This idea that Jesus would be raised from the dead is, is foreshadowed 
in the things that he was teaching, the things that he was talking about, and it's given credibility, if you will, when he was transfigured because it proved him to be a divine son of God. So when he tells them, look, I'm going to be killed, but I'm going to be raised from the dead, they could believe him because of what they had just seen. Now, it was hard for the disciples, and we need to appreciate how hard it was for them to believe this. But we on this side of things can look back and we can believe it. We have so much more evidence and in 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul talks about this, about this idea that the resurrection of Christ is a well-established fact, and it points forward to our resurrection. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, notice verses 3 and 4, where he says, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. That was what happened in the events at Jerusalem with the trial of Jesus and him being raised. That was what was preached. That was what was proved by the miracles of the apostles and prophets as they went out teaching about the resurrection of Christ. It gave credibility to this. So Christ was raised from the dead. The Corinthians had been taught that and they had believed it, but there was a disturbance among them about there would not be a resurrection of the dead. So the 15th chapter is devoted to teaching people there is going to be a general resurrection of the dead. And all people will be raised from the dead. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you jump down to verse 20, it says, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. You see, everyone is going to be raised from the dead when the Lord returns. It's not just the righteous, but all people are going to be raised from the dead. In fact, in John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, Jesus doing the teaching here confirms or affirms or echoes what it is that Paul wrote about in 1 Corinthians 15. Or maybe we should say Paul echoed what Jesus taught. But John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, he says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. He says there's going to be an hour, a specific point in time, when the Lord returns and he's going to call all men out of the graves, some to the resurrection of life, some to the resurrection of condemnation. So the righteous and the unrighteous will be raised from the dead. Now, when Jesus is up on the Mount of Transfiguration, he's giving evidence that he's this divine son of God. And when he's coming down, he tells him, don't tell anybody about what you've seen until I'm raised from the dead. So he's pointing forward to his resurrection, which, friends, points forward to our resurrection. Now, how do we prepare for our resurrection? The answer to that is simply we must follow Christ. We must submit to him as our Lord and master. Again, we go back to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, and this is that other lesson and really the big lesson of the Mount of Transfiguration is the idea that we are to follow Christ Jesus. Now, notice again, when he's in discussion with Moses and Elijah, that Peter says, it's good for us to be here. Let us build a tabernacle for you, for Moses, and for Elijah. And when Peter said that, that's when the cloud overshadows them. And when God says this in verse 35, Luke 9, 35, this is my beloved son, hear him. What does that mean? That means he's telling Peter, you're not to follow Moses. You're not to follow Elijah. You're to follow Jesus. You see, Moses in this, he was really there, but he really represents the law. And Elijah 
represents the prophets, the law and the prophets, which you take those two things together, that's the Old Testament. So the law and the prophets, that they are there represented, and here's Jesus. And when Peter wants to equal or equally um, honor all three of them, God the Father steps in in an overwhelming way and says, no, they're not equal. You need to listen to my son. Hear him. You see, this tells us and shows us in a very vivid way the Old Testament has been removed. It's no longer our source of authority. We don't live under it. The Old Testament was for specific people for a specific time, but it's not for us. Notice Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. It says, For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinance, ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. You see, it's telling us that that old law was done away with in the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. And then a new covenant was put into place. That is the covenant of Jesus Christ. And friends, just think about this. We have our Bibles separated into Old and New Testament. There's an Old Testament, an Old Covenant, and a New Testament, a New Covenant. The old one was done away with in the sacrifice of Christ. And it is now that we live under the new. Are we saying the old is no good? No. Are we saying the old is bad? No. We're simply saying that we are not under the authority of the Old Testament now. The Old Testament's good. In Romans chapter 15, verse 4, it says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scripture might have hope. Do you see, we can go back to the Old Testament and learn many, many lessons. We can learn great lessons of faith and trial and suffering and hardship and how that God dealt with his people and he punished those who were rebellious and he blessed those who were faithful and how that he guided and worked in the nations of men to bring about his will and to bless his people. So a lot of lessons there. We can learn about a lot of things that give us great confidence about God's plan of salvation and Christ coming into the world, but we're no longer under the Old Testament. You see, there are people today who think we should follow tenets of the Old Testament. They go back there for their authority and their religious beliefs or their religious practices, and we're not to do that. You know, there were Christians in the first century who were trying to do that. They were trying to go back and grab pieces of the Old Testament and bring it into this new covenant, this new testament under Christ. And that was condemned again and again. One place is in Galatians chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. The Apostle Paul is here dealing with the churches of Galatia, the Christians there, how they were straying from the truth by trying to go back and grab pieces of the old law and make that binding and authoritative while they were trying to be followers of Christ. So in Galatians 5 verse 3, it says, and I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Do you see they were going back, grabbing the circumcision? That's the illustration here. That's the issue that he picks out to focus on. They're trying to get circumcision out of the Old Testament and bind it on Christians in the New and telling them, you have to do this because it's written in the law. And Paul tells him, look, you go back and grab circumcision. You have to take the whole law. You have to take the sacrifices, the priesthood. You have to take the feast days. You have to take everything under the old law. He says, but what you've done, verse four, you become estranged from Christ. You were with Christ. You were in fellowship with Christ, but now you are estranged from Christ. When you try to go back to the old law, you try to be the disciples of Moses and the disciples of Jesus at the same time. You separate yourself from Jesus. You try to keep the old law. You're no longer in fellowship with the Lord. But he says, you go back to that law, you have fallen from grace. 
You've separated yourself and you stand condemned for it. Yes, we can learn from the Old Testament, but it is not our authority. Our authority is the New Testament as Jesus declared himself in Matthew chapter 28 as he was about to ascend back into heaven after his resurrection. He's teaching his disciples here in Matthew 28 verse 18 that Jesus came and spoke to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. See, all authority is Christ. There's no authority in Moses now. There's no authority in Elijah now. But there is authority in Christ and in him alone. And that's why God the Father said on the Mount of Transfiguration, this is my beloved son, hear him, listen to him. And we need to listen to him on all subjects. The subject of salvation, we have to listen to him. Jesus goes on to talk about that right here in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So we have to listen to what Jesus says about salvation, not what men say, not what Moses says, not what anybody else would say in the Old Testament. But what is it that the Lord taught? What is it he authorized his apostles to teach? And here he says, you go and you make disciples of the nations, followers of me, by baptizing them and then teaching them to do everything that I command. In Acts chapter 2, we read an account here of the day of Pentecost and how that day about 3,000 souls responded to the gospel. They were baptized in Acts 2.41. And notice Acts 2.42 tells us what they're doing in their worship. It says, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. They were involved in teaching, studying the word of God. They were involved in prayers that were being offered up. They were involved in fellowship that is a sharing together, a common treasury as they gave to, to see to the needs of the saints who were there and to carry out the work of the church in the breaking of bread that is the observing of the Lord's Supper, the communion. So, Whether it comes to worship or its salvation, we understand our authority is found in the New Testament, not the Old. It's found in Christ, not in Moses. That is really the big lesson that we learn out of the Mount of Transfiguration. So when we look at this account in Luke 9, about Jesus going up to the mountain, being transfigured, all the events that unfolded there, we see there's overwhelming evidence that he is indeed the divine son of God. He came to this earth. He sacrificed his life. He was raised from the dead. He returned to heaven and rules and reigns at the right hand of God. And he is going to return one day in judgment to resurrect us from the dead, to stand before him and give an account of our lives. Now, we Therefore, must follow him to prepare for that day. Not Moses, not Elijah, not any other man. But we must fully submit to his will and truly make Jesus Lord of our lives. Thank you for watching The Word and Sword brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to go to our Facebook page and leave a comment or question about this episode. Our members are ready to assist you with any questions and will work to share a Bible answer with you. The web address for our Facebook page is facebook.com slash word and sword. That's facebook.com slash word and sword. Or you can simply go to Facebook and search word and sword TV program. In this study, we want to look at the organization of the church. And we begin by going back to the Old Testament to notice God's attitude toward the tabernacle and the things that he commanded to Moses. In Exodus chapter 25, verse 9, it says, According to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. 
So God revealed the pattern to Moses, and he says, you need to follow that pattern just so, exactly like I show you is how you need to make it. And this is repeated through chapter 25, all the little details that that are given there. And it says that Moses did what God told him to do. Remember in verse 40, he says, and see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. So Moses strove very diligently to follow exactly what it was that God did. And remember, there were a lot of details in in these things. And the point is that God wanted it done his way. And when he laid it out, he was not going to tolerate them doing it a different way and going by their own will. If you remember in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, it says, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Now, when you read through the Old Testament and see how God had commanded this to be done, they were to get fire from a very specific spot before the altar, but they got fire from somewhere else, from somewhere God did not command them, but God commanded them to get fire from before the altar. And when they didn't do that, they got it from another place. In other words, they interjected their own will and followed their own way instead of following the pattern God had laid out, God struck them dead here. So a very powerful example, very powerful object lesson, if you will, that God wants things done his way. And he's not going to tolerate men doing it their way. So great lessons we can learn from this. Let's understand that, you know, The same God that ruled in the Old Testament is the God who rules today, and he still expects us to follow his will. We're not free to do just whatever it is that we want to do. Remember in Hebrews chapter 8, Hebrews chapter 8, in verses 1 through 6, he says, Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens a minister of the sanctuary, and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. So he's talking about the church here. For every high priest appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, therefore it is necessary that this one, that is Christ, also have something to offer. For if he would on if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law. Remember, Jesus wasn't from the priestly tribe of Levi. He was from the tribe of Judah. And so it's talking about, you know, Jesus is not like them and doesn't do the same things as them. So there's a change in this pattern, a change in the law here. But verse five, he says, these old priests in the Old Testament served the copy and shadow of the heavenly things as Moses was divinely instructed for he when he was about to make the tabernacle, for he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also a mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. So what the Hebrew writer is laying out for us here is we have a superior covenant, a superior priesthood we live under with the priesthood of Christ, And just as Moses was warned to follow the things that God had revealed to him, we need to follow the things that are revealed to us. Notice Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3. In Colossians 3, 17, it says, And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do, word or deed, you do it by the authority or in the name of Jesus Christ. So we're required to follow him. It's kind of baffling where people get the concept that we can do what we want to do, what feels good to us, because the Bible gives these warnings about men need to follow what God has commanded, what he has revealed to them. And there are plenty of warnings, like the book of 1 Corinthians is filled with warnings about people going their own way and doing their own thing. So we want to understand that God reveals to men what he wants, including 
in the New Testament, he's revealed what he wants for the church. And we need to respect what he was revealed, what he has revealed. So we're going to look at this idea of the organization of the church and how it's been revealed in the New Testament. We want to notice things about the universal church and things about the local church. And then we'll do some comparison and contrast with what men put into practice today. So to begin with, let's look at this idea of the universal church and its organization in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, to begin with. Remember, this is where Jesus declared to his disciples that he would build his church. Very specifically, he says, and I also say to you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, just a note in the context here, Peter's confessed Jesus is the Christ. And Jesus says on this rock, on that truth, on that absolute truth, not on Peter, but on the truth or the reality that Jesus is the Christ, he would build his church. That, that's what underpins the entire thing is the reality of who Jesus is. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. That is when he was put to death. And Jesus went into the Hadean world that wasn't going to trap him there, but he came out in the resurrection. So you have the church that's being spoken of here, and he's talking about the universal church. And the universal church is rather simple in its organization. In Ephesians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul writes about that organization, and he says that Christ is the head of the church or the head of the body. In Ephesians 1, verse 22, notice he says this, And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And that's a really easy concept for you and I to get, that you have the head, then you have the body. There's one head and there's one body. That's the concept of the universal church. Very simple, if you will. So Jesus is the head, and that means that all Christians, all who are devoted to Jesus, are in the body. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27, it says, Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. In Romans 12, verse 5, Romans chapter 12, verse 5, it says, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So we're individual members if we are Christians, but we are all in that one body of Christ. So one head and one body, the head, Jesus, the body being the disciples of Christ. And Jesus being the head of the church, he's the one who has the right to command it. No man has the right. No man has the authority to direct the universal church. There are some who claim that, but no man has that right to do that. And there is no organization that has the right to dictate to the universal church what to do, what to believe, what to practice. So Jesus, being the head of the church, the head of the body, is the only one who has the right. And the organization of the universal church, let's understand, is perfect because God's the one who designed it. Christ is the one who leads it. And it is a sin to attempt to alter it in any way. So that's the universal church. Well, what about the local church? Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, just to notice this concept or this idea of a local church or what we might also call a local congregation of God's people in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. So to the church of God at Corinth, to this local congregation. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, we see the organization of the local church. How is it organized? Remember, the universal church has an organization, has a head and a body. Well, what about the local church? How is it organized? How is it made up? In Philippians 1, verse 1, Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, 
Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. So you have bishops and deacons along with the saints who are there at Philippi. So let's draw this out a little bit. Let's get into some details about that. The bishops. Well, in the New Testament, the word bishop is the same thing as being an overseer, as being a presbyter, as being a shepherd or pastor, or being an elder. In Acts chapter 14, as Paul is going around and teaching along with Barnabas, and they establish churches, and then they make a return trip to visit those churches. And it tells us in verse 22, they're going through and strengthening the souls of the disciples. And it says in Acts 14, 23, so when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So they appointed elders or these bishops, these shepherds, these pastors in every church. You remember in Acts 20, verse 17, it refers to the elders of the church at Ephesus and that these elders at the church of Ephesus in Acts 20, again, verse 17, that they went and talked to the apostle Paul. And then in verses 28 through 32, notice what Paul says to these men. In Acts 20, verse 28, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers or bishops to shepherd or pastor the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So he tells them, you are to oversee this church. You are the leaders of the church at Ephesus. And we can notice the qualifications of these men in 1 Timothy chapter 3. The Apostle Paul lays out qualifications for men who would be elders. They're, again, also called bishops, as Titus chapter 1 points out. But 1 Timothy chapter 3, I would just like for us to read through these qualifications here. And think about these men who are to be pastors or to be shepherds. This is what they are. 1 Timothy 3, verse 1. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. See, very specific qualifications that a man must meet in order to be an elder or a bishop or a shepherd or a pastor, as we've already discussed. And these men are given overall leadership of a congregation, and the congregation is to respect that leadership. But let's understand that these men are not above the Word of God. We ought to obey God rather than man, as the apostle Peter declared. So these men are the leaders of the congregation. But again, Philippians 1 verse 1 said there were bishops and deacons. Now the word deacon is just another word for servant. And in 1 Timothy chapter 3, again, verses 8 and following, we have qualifications for deacons. And notice this with me. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanders, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For those who have served well as deacons, obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. See, there's qualifications for these men as well. And they serve under the direction of the elders, the leadership of the elders. They support the work and they help to carry out the work of the church 
in an efficient manner. A great illustration of this, if you want to look at it sometime, is in Acts 20, when, or rather Acts chapter 6, when there were widows being neglected in the church at Jerusalem, and there was complaints and problems coming up. There were men appointed to oversee the distribution of the funds to the needy widows so that everything was done right and done well. And so that's the concept of deacons. They carry out a specific service in a congregation and they have qualifications. So Philippians 1, 1 again, you have the saints who are at Philippi with the bishops and the deacons. So you have the bishops who oversee, the deacons who serve, and then you have the rest who are called saints, but really bishops and deacons are saints as well. But it's talking about the saints, and among them are bishops and deacons who are serving. So the saints is just simply the idea of a Christian, somebody who's been sanctified by the blood of Christ, somebody who's obeyed the gospel. They've had their sins washed away, and they're now a child of God, and they're a part of this local church. So let's notice in Acts chapter 9, very interesting account here in Acts 9. This is when Saul of Tarsus, we better know him as Paul, he's been converted and he ends up going back to Jerusalem and he wants to be a part of the church there in Acts 9 verse 26. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with them at Jerusalem coming in and going out. And what this tells us is that there were identifiable groups, identifiable congregations that had standards of being a member of that congregation. And they didn't think Saul of Tarsus measured up to those standards until Barnabas stood up and said, yes, he's faithful. He's been truly converted. He's not the same man he used to be. He's he's serving God. He's preaching the name of Christ. And so they allowed him to be a part of that work. And it says there again in verse 28, he was coming in and going out. He was working and having fellowship with the church at Jerusalem. So churches are distinct, identifiable groups that have standards of membership. They have leadership within them, bishops and deacons among them. And these Groups gather together to carry out the work that God has given them to do. They get together to worship. They get together to teach, to study together. They work together to teach the world around them. And when there is a need among their members, they pitch together to meet that need. As we mentioned a while ago in Acts chapter 6, there were needy widows among them, and they took care of that need. So this is the work that God has given them to do. They come together to do that as a people. So there is an organization in the local church. Now, if you will, in a sense, churches are going to be organized, if you will, in one of four ways. And let's just think this through for a minute. They can be scripturally organized and have elders and deacons serving among the saints in a local congregation. That is, you have men who are qualified, according to 1 Timothy 3, to serve as bishops and deacons, and those men are appointed and serving as bishops and deacons. That's scripturally organized. Now, you can have a scripturally unorganized church as well, if you will. So, if no men are qualified and no men are serving, or there's not a plurality qualified, and there are no men serving as bishops and deacons, then that congregation can still assemble, it can still function because they these churches here where they had men appointed obviously were functioning and worshiping together, studying together before men were appointed as leaders. So you can be scripturally unorganized. No one's qualified or there's not a plurality qualified and no one is serving in those positions. But you can also have unscripturally unorganized churches. So it goes like this. If you have a congregation where there are men who are qualified, a plurality of men qualified to be bishops and deacons, but they're not appointed to serve, 
then that is unorganized. So nobody's in there serving in the leadership, but they should be. So that's unscriptural if that's prevented. You know, sometimes people don't want leaders appointed over them. And so they'll work to prevent that. Well, that's unscriptural. So that's why we say it's unscripturally unorganized. But then there is unscripturally organized, if you will. And there's a great example of this in 3 John. In 3 John verses 9 through 11, the Apostle John addresses an issue in the church that he's writing to. In 3 John verse 9, he says, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds, which he does, prating against us with malicious words, and not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren, and forbid those who wish to, putting them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. So do you see what's happening here? He's saying that Diotrephes is like a dictator in that church. So it's organized, but it's unscriptural because you have one man rule and you have one man who's enforcing his will over the will of the others. Now you could have other unscripturally organized churches if you have women who are leading the church or men who are not qualified that are leading the church, that would be unscripturally un organized as well. But let's wrap up by thinking about this. There is a difference between what we see in the Bible and what we see in the religions of men around us and what we see in a lot of churches around us. You know, churches by men, churches established by men don't respect the universal organization of the church. The Roman Catholic Church has a second head. They say the Pope is the head of the church. Now, we've just studied in the Bible where it says Jesus is the head of the church. But the Roman Catholic religion says, oh, there's a second head. So there's two heads for one body. And you and I can see that concept doesn't make any sense. That's not scriptural. The Episcopal Church and others have a democratic organization and oversight. They have their legislatures, they have their appointed representatives that go and vote on things and they elect people to different offices and things like that. They run it like a democracy. Well, that's not the universal church. The universal church is a monarchy with Christ as head, one monarch as the head. And so those who try to turn it into democracy have violated the scriptures concerning the universal church. And a lot of people have an idea that the universal body of Christ is made up of a lot of different religious groups, that is, denominations, it's divided up. But that's not what we read in the New Testament. We don't read of different religious groups with different practices, beliefs, and names, and there are all these different ones who come together to make up one body. Rather, what we read is there's one body. They share the same faith the same head, the same organization. They're in that one body. There's Christ the head, and then all the saints, all of them, make up the body. Not a bunch of little churches, not a bunch of big churches, not groups of churches making up that body, but the saints make up that body. That's what we read about in the Word of God. But yet there's so many people who have a misconception about that, and these people have created their own laws, their own organizations. They've established their earthly headquarters, and none of that is authorized by the Word of God. Now, what about local churches? We've studied in the Word of God where you have bishops and plurality of them who are elders or shepherds or pastors, and you have deacons, and there's qualifications. Well, any congregation that has one man as a pastor and the head over that, or a priest or a bishop or anything like that, that's not what we read about in the New Testament. So it's not authorized by the Lord. You have some who have leaders who are not qualified. I mean, how many pastors out there don't have children or are not even married? And yet, they're appointed to lead. But we studied in 1 Timothy 3 that both bishops who are elders or pastors and deacons are to be men who are married and men who have children. Or they have women who are leading their churches. When the Bible clearly lays out that men are to be the leaders 
in the churches. Now, that's not a slight against women. That's just what God has revealed. That's the way and the order that he has given to us. And it's not for us to question that or to say, well, God, you're just not up with the times and allow the culture around us to warp our understanding of what the Word of God teaches. We need to simply submit to it and follow it, just as Moses was commanded to submit to and to follow the pattern that God gave to him. The church was purchased by the blood of Christ, and we need to respect what it is that the Lord teaches about the church, both in universal organization and in a local congregation and how it is organized. This program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ, a non-denominational group of Christians devoted to following the New Testament as the sole authority for our beliefs and practices. If you live in the area, we invite you to visit our services and get to know us. We have members who drive 45 minutes to an hour one way to assemble with us. We meet on Sundays at 9.30 a.m. for Bible class and 11 a.m. for worship. On Wednesday, we have Bible studies at 7 p.m. We are located at 656 St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina. That's 656 St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina. This viewer question comes from Rebecca H. And she asks, are we saved by an experience? And that's a good question because a lot of people have that question and there's a lot of teaching out there in the religious world around the idea that salvation does come through some type of experience. Now, let's understand that salvation is an experience. It's something that an individual would go through. But the question is really getting at what type of experience is it? Is salvation known because of a heavenly vision or some type of mystical event that occurs when we are out in nature, or maybe it comes to us in a dream? Is it some type of unusual feeling of excitement or peaceful feeling sweeping over you? Some people would think that the Holy Spirit somehow comes and directly infuses them with that type of feeling to let them know that they have been saved. Maybe people think, well, you're supposed to hear a voice, and that is what tells you about being saved or some type of miraculous event. Well, is an experience how we know we are saved? Is that really what the Bible teaches? And when we look into the Word of God, we're going to see the answer to this question, to the viewer's question, and then to that other question of basically, how is it that we are saved? And to do this, what we want to do is look at the conversion of Saul of Tarsus in Acts chapter 9. You know Saul is better known as Paul the Apostle, but in Acts 9, he is Saul of Tarsus. And previous to this, of course, he was present at the stoning death of Stephen. He guarded the coats of those who were stoning him to death. It talks about in Acts chapter 8 that he was breathing out threats and murders against the church. He went about persecuting the church. And in Acts chapter 9, it leads us up to this point where he's continuing in his murderous rampage against the disciples of the Lord, but his life takes a radical change. So let's read Acts chapter 9 verses 1 through 9 and begin to dig into this idea about how salvation comes about and is salvation by an experience. So Acts 9 beginning in verse 1. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. 
Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. So we see Saul continuing to continuing to persecute Christians here and following them even to these foreign cities. It says in verse 2 there that he had gone to the high priest to receive authority to go and to persecute those who were of the way. It's interesting to note just there, by the way, that there was an identifiable single way that people followed to be disciples of Christ. There were not many different ways, but just one way. And as he's going out to persecute them, as he's traveling from Jerusalem to Damascus, it says here in particular in verse 3, that a light shone around him from heaven, and he fell to the ground, and then he heard a voice. And that voice was, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So it was an audible thing as well as a visual thing that was occurring here. And if you will, to put it in the context of our question, this was an experience that Saul of Tarsus was going through at this time as he was on his road or on his way to Damascus. And the question is, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting Christians? See, persecuting Christ is done by persecuting his people because he is now in heaven. And when anybody would persecute them, of course, they are persecuting him. But notice what Saul asked in verse 5 again. Acts 9, verse 5. He said, who are you, Lord? So Saul did not know who it was that was speaking to him. When he was on the road to Damascus, he was not expecting anything like this. He did not expect to receive a vision. He did not expect to hear a voice. He was not seeking some type of conversion experience, if you will. He was not seeking to be filled with the Spirit and some type of uh, feeling of excitation or elation in any way. He was on the way to Damascus as an enemy of Christ, and yet the Lord there appeared to him, and the Lord spoke to him. So he asked that question, who are you? Not knowing who this was, he said, who are you, Lord? And notice that Jesus responded, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. In other words, you're resisting something that you really can't resist. Ultimately, you won't win this, Saul. But he identifies himself as Jesus. In other words, Jesus of Nazareth, the one that was put on the cross, that's who I am. That's who was speaking to Saul on the road to Damascus. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now, notice Saul's response in verse 6. This is very critical here. So he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? So in verse 5, he says, who are you, Lord? And then the, Jesus says, I'm Jesus. And Saul's response is, Lord, what do you want me to do? At this point, Saul believes. He believes that Jesus is Lord. And he asks that question because he's ready to be obedient to the Lord. What do you want me to do? He's been confronted with the truth, the truth that he had denied, and he recognizes he needs to make a change in his life. So when this happened, the Lord responds to him and tells him in verse 6, arise and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. So, you know, there was something to do. And he was to go into the city and be told what he must do. There was an obligation on his part to submit to the will of God. And he wanted to do that. And he recognized that. But the Lord didn't tell him what that was. It's very interesting, isn't it? That here he saw Jesus. He was hearing Jesus. Jesus was speaking directly to him. And he asked, what do you want me to do? And the Lord doesn't tell him 
what to do other than go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. You have to be taught. You don't have a choice. You don't have an obligation. He says you'll be told what you must do. It's an obligation on Saul's part. So the men who were with him, it says in verse seven, they heard the voice, but did not see anyone in the follow up account where Saul is retelling this story in Acts 22. It says that they heard, but they didn't hear. You know, sometimes we maybe hear people in the next room talking and we know they're talking. So we hear them, but we don't understand what they're saying. That's kind of what happened with these men. But they see Saul on the ground and they help him up and they take him on into Damascus. And it says that Saul is blind on this occasion. So they have to lead him in there. And notice verse nine, Acts nine, verse nine. It says he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. What does that tell us? Why does it mention that he neither ate nor drank? Well, the reason it tells us that is because he is penitent. This is a manifestation of grief and of sorrow over what he's been doing. He's been fighting against the Lord. You see, he truly believed he was doing what was right, but he had been going against the one He thought he was serving and he had been persecuting Christians. He had been needlessly and shamelessly attacking and harming the children of God. And so when he finds out he's been completely wrong this whole time, he is devastated. So this is a sign of godly sorrow, a sign of repentance. Now, notice verses 10 to 16, Acts 9, 10 to 16. It says, now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he was seen, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So in Damascus is this one named Ananias. He's a preacher. Uh, an evangelist, if you will, of the Lord. And he would have been one of the targets that Saul was going to find in Damascus to persecute him and to drag him back to Jerusalem to put him on trial and persecute him for his faith in Jesus Christ. But this Ananias is told, you go to Saul and you go and you teach him. He's expecting you. He He's going to to receive you, and he needs to receive his sight. You two need to restore his sight. Well, Ananias is reluctant to do this because he's heard and he knows about the reputation of Saul and says, you know, he's here to drag us off to prison. He's here to cause us harm. But notice that Jesus tells him to go. You go because I've chosen him And he is being shown that he's going to suffer for me. But let's back up and notice one very important thing in verse 11. Acts 9, verse 11. What is it that Saul is doing? Remember, he's on the road to Damascus. The vision of Jesus appears to him. That bright light shines around him. Jesus speaks to him. Jesus identified himself. Saul accepted that testimony, accepted that identity and called him Lord and asked him, what do you want me to do? And now when he's gone into the city, these three days, he's not eating or drinking. What is he doing? So Acts 9, 11 says, you go to the house of Judas and for one called Saul of Tarsus And behold, for behold, he is praying. So he's filled with regret or repentance, and he is praying. And this is because he believed in Jesus as a Christ. So there's belief, repentance, and prayer taking place here. Think about that and remember that as we continue to look at the account. So pick up in verse 17 here. 
It says, And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, he has sent me to you that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. You see what's happened here? That Ananias goes to him. Saul received his sight. And then it says that he arose and was baptized. Now, let's go to where Paul is later telling others about these events. In Acts 22, so he explains this. The, the Bible often serves as its own best commentary where it's stated in one portion of the Bible about an event or about some type of teaching. And then in another place, it addresses that same issue and gives a little bit different light to it or fills in some details. And that's what's happening here in Acts 9. We read of the account of where Saul was on the road to Damascus, how he went into Damascus, and then how he Ananias came to him and told him what he needed to do. Now, Acts 22 gives us more details as to what happened on this occasion. So, Acts 22, we want to pick up here in verse 12 and read down through verse 16. Then a certain Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at the same hour, I looked up at him. Then he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men and of what you have seen and heard. And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Do you see what's happening here? That when Ananias came to him, he does acknowledge and say, you know, God is doing this and this is the working of God and the Lord has appeared to you, but he's appeared to you for a purpose Verse 15, for you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. You remember one of the qualifications for an apostle was to see the risen Lord. And so the Lord had to appear to Paul in order to qualify him to be an apostle, to go out and to be a witness of his resurrection, a personal witness. And that's why he appeared to him on the road to Damascus. And that's why the Lord... Uh, told him, you need to go into the city to be told what you must do in the answer to the question of, Lord, what would you want me to do or what must I do? In order to be saved, he had to be told what he must do. And that's where we read here that Saul tells him, or rather Ananias tells Saul, verse 16, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Now put, put the account together. Saul's on the road to Damascus. The Lord appears to him. He confesses his belief when he says, Lord, what, you do want, what do you want me to do? Go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. So he believed. He goes into the city. He's praying for three days, neither eating or drinking because he's filled with repentance, regret and sorrow, godly sorrow over what he had done. And now when Ananias shows up to him, he tells him what he has to do. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. You see, that's what he was told to do in order to have his sins forgiven in order to be saved. And that's a separate issue from him becoming an apostle. The Lord appearing to him was for the purpose of becoming an apostle. The evangelist coming and preaching to him was for the purpose of his soul being saved. You see, if salvation was by an experience, the case of Saul of Tarsus would have been the test case, the, the case study, if you will, for somebody being saved by an experience. I mean, what greater experience could you have than the Lord Jesus Christ himself appearing to you? But he wasn't saved in that experience because, again, he believed when the Lord appeared to him. He was filled with repentance. He was praying but when the preacher came to him three days later, he was still in his sin because he was commanded, arise and be baptized and wash away 
your sins. Do you see that? So to answer that question about are we saved by an experience, yes, we are saved in an experience, if you will, that is in hearing the word of God, believing that word, repenting of our sins, confessing Jesus as the Christ, Lord, confessing him as Lord, and being baptized. So going through those things is how we are saved. We're baptized and rise up to walk in the newness of life. So, yes, that's true, but we're not saved through an experience as many people think of it commonly, as we mentioned in the beginning, through some mysterious feeling or through some voice coming to us or through some type of event that's going on that would be a supernatural event, if you will. So are we saved by an experience? We're saved by applying the word of God to our life. We're not saved through some type of mystical experience. So people who are depending on some type of feeling to tell them or to inform them that they're saved are depending on something that is not based in the Bible, in a scriptural experience or scriptural teaching, I should say. But rather, we know we're saved When we look at the word of God, see the steps of salvation and follow those steps to hear the word of God, to believe that, to confess Jesus as a Christ, to repent or to turn away from our sins and to be baptized, to have our sins washed away. If you have a question, please submit that and we'll be happy to answer that for you from the Bible and to help you to have a deeper and better understanding of the Word of God. Thank you for watching this Bible study program brought to you by the Newton, North Carolina Church of Christ. If you do not live in the area but want to connect with a local group of Christians striving to follow the New Testament alone, then please contact us. While we are non-denominational and each congregation is independent, We have many personal contacts across the country and even around the world with which we can put you in touch. So just contact us and we will assist you in connecting with a local group of Christians. You can email us at contact at wordandsword.com. You can call us at 828-465-3009. That's 828-465-3009. Or post a comment on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash word and sword. Many people today claim to have some type of spiritual gift, some type of miraculous power. There are various religious groups that make claims to this. There would be the Assemblies of God, Pentecostals. There would be charismatic spread out among a number of denominations. Uh, Roman Catholics claim that miracles occur today. Even Mormons make a claim to some type of miraculous gifts or miraculous events that take place. Now, the things that they say that can be done today is things like healing the sick or receiving a message from God, a direct divine revelation. Uh, some people even claim that they can raise the dead. And when we look at this and we see these different people claiming different miraculous gifts, and yet they're so radically different in their beliefs and in their practices, it may be confusing that the very idea of miraculous gifts or the existence of them or how they can be used or when they are used can be very confusing. And we may be uncertain and unsure how to deal with these types of claims, but this really shouldn't be that great of a challenge for us because in Hebrews chapter 6, it tells us that this laying on of hands is a basic or fundamental doctrine in the Word of God. In Hebrews 6 verses 1 and 2, he says, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrines of baptism of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. So he says, here are some elementary principles, and he lists out various ones, and he includes laying on of hands, and he says, these are basic things that you should already have down, 
you should be going on to things that are more weighty, more meaty, if you will. And so we want to examine this idea of the laying on of hands. The foundation of our faith, we understand, is bolstered when we know what the Word of God teaches about this subject. There's no need for us to be deceived. There's the ability when we study God's Word to answer these confusing questions that come up or these situations that come up where we may get into a discussion about them or we hear a report about them, that we don't have to be unsettled by that. So we want to open up the Word of God and notice what the New Testament teaches about the laying on of hands. So we're going to see that there are three different types of of laying on of hands in the New Testament. So to begin with, let's go to Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28. And this is one sense in which there is the laying on of hands dealing with miraculous powers, miraculous gifts. In Acts chapter 28, remember, this is after Paul had been on a long sea voyage as a prisoner. They had been caught up into the storm and now they are shipwrecked and they find themselves on an island. It says in Acts 28 verse 1 on Malta. And we know where that is today in the Mediterranean Sea, but they're shipwrecked here. And so Paul and the others who are traveling with him, the other prisoners, the Roman soldiers who are keeping guard over them, they're all there on this island for a while because uh, they've been shipwrecked there. Well, we see in verses seven through nine where Paul performs a miracle. This is after Paul had gathered up sticks and a viper had come out and bitten him and the people observed him and thought, well, he should swell up. He should die because this is a very poisonous viper. But nothing happened to him. He just shook it off, threw it into the fire, and he was perfectly fine. And they recognized this, and that amazed them and stunned them. And so these events are unfolding. And in verse 7, Acts 28, verse 7, notice what it says. In that region, there was an estate of the leading citizen of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and entertained us courteously for three days. And it happened that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and dysentery. Paul went into him and prayed, and he laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. So Paul performs a miracle on the father of this one named Publius here. His father had the fever, had dysentery. Paul prayed, Paul laid hands on him, and he was healed. So this is a miraculous event, obviously, that's being described here. And then others hear about this, and they come to Paul that they could be healed as well of their diseases, of whatever ailments they may have. Now, let's tie that into this next thing that is taught again in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 8, we have a record of where Philip, the evangelist, goes to the area of Samaria, and he's preaching the gospel there. And while he's preaching, there is also one by the name of Simon the sorcerer that is brought up in this account. So let's just pick up in Acts 8 verse 5. And we want to read down through verse 13, and then we'll pick up again in a minute and read a little bit further. But Acts 8, verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man named Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God." And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. And when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. So think about what is taking place here. Philip 
is going to preach. And he is there preaching the word of God. And to confirm that that word is from God, he's performing these miracles, just like Paul had done where we read in Acts 28 on the island of Malta. He was performing miracles, confirming the teaching that he was doing. This is how people knew the message was from God and that these men just weren't speaking their own ideas and their own thoughts. They weren't just another philosopher coming along and teaching them something new. So Philip is here in Samaria. He's teaching the word of God. He's performing miracles. He's casting out demons. He's healing the sick. And the people are convicted. Yes, this is the word of God. They obey that word. But it mentions that there is one who is Simon the sorcerer, that he had previously practiced sorcery. He did his tricks and the people, not knowing any better, thought he had some kind of great power. But they could tell the difference between what Philip was doing and what Simon was doing or had done. And then Simon himself, it says, even saw and realized that what Philip was doing was not what he was doing. So this trickster, this sorcerer who was using just tricks to deceive people that he had some great power, admitted that what Philip was doing was not a trick. It was indeed a miracle from the power of God. And so the people obeyed. They were baptized. Simon obeyed. He was baptized, seeing the miracles which were done. So that's the, the background to what's happening here. Now, pick up in Acts 8, verse 14. We want to read down through verse 16 and notice something very interesting that is recorded here in this account. It says, now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. So let's look at what's happening here. It said in verse 12 that the people believed what Philip preached concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, and both men and women were baptized. And then it says that Simon himself believed and he was baptized. So these people were saved. They believed they were baptized, as Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. That's what these people did. And when the apostles at Jerusalem learned that there were new Christians in Samaria, they sent Peter and John to them in order that they might receive the Holy Spirit. And it says that when this happened, in verse 17, they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So they received miraculous gifts as well. So Simon saw that and he thought that's really neat. And Simon fell back into his old ways and he offered the apostles money saying, let me have this power so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. So let's think about this now. There are two types of laying ons of hands here that are being discussed. One of them is where Philip's performing the miracles and healing people who are sick. And the other one is where the apostles come and lay hands on people to receive the Holy Spirit. Laying on of hands. But did you also notice that it was only the apostles who could do this? Philip could not do it. Philip could not lay his hands on someone and give them miraculous powers. It was only the apostles who could do that. The same thing is recorded later with the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 19. But looking at this case here, we see that it was the apostles who had the ability to pass on miraculous powers. And since there are no apostles today, then that ability doesn't exist today because you remember that there were certain qualifications for apostles outlined in Acts chapter 1. They had to accompany the, the Lord Jesus from the baptism of John to his ascension into heaven. And 
if they didn't have that qualification and being chosen by the Lord, then they could not be an apostle. So follow the logic. Only apostles could lay hands on people and give them the gift of the Holy Spirit that is spiritual gifts. That's why in Samaria, Philip could not do that. And the apostles had to be sent there in order for people to receive miraculous gifts. Therefore, since there are no apostles today, and apostles are the only ones who could do that, there are no spiritual gifts today, no miraculous powers being bestowed on people today. There's no laying on of hands. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 tells us about this. In fact, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13 that there was a time coming when the miraculous gifts would cease. And that's what we see with the close of the New Testament. Those gifts were given for the revelation and the confirmation of the word. And when that work was accomplished, when it was finished, then the need for those spiritual gifts came to an end. In Mark 16, verse 20, it says, And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. See, he confirmed that word. This word doesn't need to be reconfirmed today. You see, people are lacking confidence in the word of God if they are asking for more miracles to prove that it's true. It's been proven true. It doesn't need to be proven again. And so those miraculous gifts were given to reveal and confirm the word that happened in the first century. The New Testament text is closed. And so the laying on of hands related to spiritual gifts was done away with. It doesn't exist anymore. And therefore, the laying on of hands to heal people does not exist anymore. But there is a third type of laying on of hands discussed in the New Testament that still exist in a sense today. If we go to Acts 13, Acts chapter 13, and we want to read here verses 1 through 3. Acts 13, 1 through 3 says, Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who is called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. Now, this Barnabas here, of course, we know him, the son of encouragement. And then Saul, verse 1, better known as the apostle Paul. So this is Barnabas and Paul being sent out by the church at Antioch because the Holy Spirit said, separate them out, send them out. I want them to go preach. And that's what they did. Now, we know Paul was an apostle. He had miraculous gifts given to him by God, directly by God. He did not need these men here at Antioch to lay hands on him so he would have the ability to perform miracles. So this laying on of hands is a different type of laying on of hands. And what this simply is, is approval. When he lays hands on, when these people laid hands on Barnabas and Paul, what they were saying is, God speed. We wish you well. We approve of this work you're going into, and we are praying on your behalf that this work will go well. So the laying on of hands in that case was a case of approval. A very similar type of thing is discussed in 1 Timothy chapter 5, 1 Timothy chapter 5, where the Apostle Paul is warning Timothy about being too quick to approve of men or to be tied to men because some men are not good. They're not right. So he says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, he in verse 22, do not lay hands on anyone hastily nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. So be careful about who you associate with. Don't give approval too quickly until you really know enough about someone that you could legitimately and safely endorse them. So we understand there is this third type of laying on of hands, which is approval, which is something that still exists today. You know, the laying on of hands, the different types and purposes is an elementary principle of the word of God. There, there's nothing here for us to be intimidated by. There's nothing really terribly complicated to understand about it. 
Two of the three types that we see in the New Testament were confined to New Testament times and don't directly apply to us today. And knowing this can give us a measure of peace, uh, of confidence. And so we need to take it to heart that when we study the Word of God, it's going to bring clarity and it's going to be bring confidence to us, whether that's studying the fundamentals like the laying on of hands or things that are more in-depth and more complex that's taught in the Word of God. So we encourage you that you open up your Bible and you study the Scriptures daily so that you too have a good grasp of the fundamentals of the Word of God and you have confidence in the truth. The members of the Newton Church of Christ thank you for watching this Bible study program. Our aim is to assist you to gain a better understanding of God's Word and encourage you to submit to the Lord. We invite you to send us an email with your Bible question or a comment about this episode. Please include your first name and the city or town where you live. We will respond with the Bible answer. You can send your email to contact at wordandsword.com. That's contact at wordandsword.com. We live in uncertain times. We have pandemics, economic turmoil, political strife in our nation. We have disputes with other nations. And so... We get concerned sometimes, but, you know, we're not the first generation to face trials such as these, and our trials are not the worst that anyone's ever faced, and they certainly won't be the last as long as this world stands. But we know that we can have confidence and we can find guidance when we look into the Word of God as to how to view these things in a proper perspective. We can learn lessons from the Word of God about God's overruling power in this world. And when we keep our focus on that, then these things that happen in our society, the upheaval in our society, will be put in perspective and won't unsettle us as much because we know that God is still in control. And to study this further and to help instill this idea of God's overruling power in this world, we want to study Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2 is an amazing chapter where one of God's people teaches a lesson that uh, the king who is presented here, Nebuchadnezzar, needed to learn, but of course he doesn't learn it until later in the book, but he should have learned it here. But it's a lesson that you and I can take to heart as well. And it's very fascinating as we look into it. So let's read Daniel chapter 2, verses 1 through 16 to begin with. It's a little bit longer reading, but it's worth grabbing the context here of what's happening. And let's begin then to, to pull the, the lesson out of what's happening here. So Daniel chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Now, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I have had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will give the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, My decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made an ash heap. However, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation." They answered and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will give its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know for certain that you would gain time, because you see that my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me, there is only one decree for you. For you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can give me its interpretation. 
The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such things of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. It is a difficult thing that the king requests, and there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. For this reason, the king was angry and very furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out, and they began killing the wise men, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. So you see what's happened here. The the king, Nebuchadnezzar, had a dream. And he wants to know what this dream means. It wasn't just an ordinary dream. He had an understanding. There's a message in here, and I don't know what it is. And so he turned to his usual men, the, it says the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans. He's turned to them to get an answer. But he's testing these men because he doesn't want them just to say what he wants to hear. He doesn't want them to make it up. So he says, look, you tell me the dream I had, and then I'll trust your interpretation. But they say, well, King, we we can't do that. That's not the way these things work. And so they're trying to get him reveal this. But the king says, you know what? What you're trying to do is gain time and you're trying to wait for the time to change. In other words, what they're doing is saying, you tell us a dream. Let us go think about it. And then we'll give you the interpretation. He's saying you're going to interpret it by things you can already see just observing around you what's happening. So that's not going to work. So he says, look, you're either going to tell me this. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to burn your house down. So that's pretty serious. He's, He's pretty set on this. And he gives the order and that begins to happen. But Daniel talks to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, and convinces him to let him to go to the king and ask the king, hey, give me time to interpret it. Give me time to work on this. So that's exactly what happened. Well, we begin in verse 17 and notice this, verse 17. And let's read here Daniel chapter 2, verse 17, and down through verse 23 to begin with. It says, And Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish and the rest of the wise men of Babylon, with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision, so Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and he raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness, and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might, and have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's demand. And so Daniel goes to his friends and asks them for help on behalf of God to appeal to God, and he appeals to God himself. And we'll come back to that in just a little bit. Now, let's go to verse 24, Daniel 2, verse 24. And this is going to be quite a bit longer reading, but we're going to go all the way down through 45. Daniel 2, 24 to 45, and see what unfolds here. And then we'll draw some lessons out of this. Therefore, Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon, 
Take me before the king, and I will tell the king the interpretation. Then Arioch quickly brought Daniel before the king and said thus to him, I have found a man of the captives, captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the vision of your head upon your bed were these. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this? And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I am more, I have more wisdom than anyone living, but for our sakes who make known the interpretation to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. You, O king, were watching and behold a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you and its form was awesome. The image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its partly of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watch while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image in its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no traces, trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. Now we will tell you the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beast of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron, partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God of heaven has made known to the king that will come, what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. And so here Daniel reveals the dream and reveals the interpretation of that dream. So the dream is that the king saw this great image, and it had four parts to that image. Gold is the head, silver, then bronze, then iron, and iron and clay in the legs and in the feet. And what he says is these represent four kingdoms. The first one is the king Nebuchadnezzar, or king of Babylon, and it represents the Babylonian kingdom, and that was a kingdom of gold, great grandeur, great glory, great wealth. Now, there's going to be a kingdom that comes after that that's inferior to it, that's silver. So gold and silver, 
And that kingdom in history was the Persian kingdom. It was a Mede and Persian combined, but the Persian kingdom. And then you have another kingdom after it that's made out of bronze. It's a strong and powerful kingdom, but it's not quite as wealthy or, if you will, as great as the others. But there is this bronze kingdom. And in history, we understand that's the Greek kingdom under Alexander the Great. And then after that is a fourth kingdom made of iron, and it's stronger than all the other ones, but of course it's not as valuable. So that fourth kingdom, history reveals to us, is the Roman kingdom. So you have Babylon and Persia and Greece and then Rome. And he says, in the days of these kings, that last one, the fourth one, that's iron, then iron of clay, and how it was very strong, but it had weakness built in within it. And you see the Roman Empire was that way. But be that as it may, he says, in the days of those kings, in the Roman kings, God would set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. It would consume all the other kingdoms. What we see is that unfolding throughout biblical history. And then in the New Testament, the Romans are ruling. That fourth kingdom is in place. And Jesus Christ comes and he establishes his kingdom. And that kingdom still exists today. All those others are on the ash heap of history. But that kingdom that the Lord established, his church, his body, his people are still alive and well today and will continue until the very end of time. So that was the message. That was the dream that was given to Nebuchadnezzar. And of course, when we look at it, we have great confidence because we see that God is in control. When we look at this, when we study this, there's a few lessons that we want to get out just very briefly and come back to that main lesson is one is leaning upon our friends. You know, Daniel, when there was this time of stress and the wise men were being killed, and that meant that Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or as they're described here, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, that these men would be killed. Daniel went to his friends who were godly, God-fearing men, and ask for their help. And so that's a lesson. When we face trials and challenges, we need to go to those who are God-fearing and seek their help and ask them to appeal to God on our behalf. But then Daniel himself, of course, turned to God as well. And we need to turn to God during trials, during temptations, to seek his wisdom and strength and guidance. But then also think about this. When you look at this, you understand that God knows the future, that God's working things out in the kingdoms of men. He worked things out from Babylon down through Rome and down to our time today, working out his will, looking out for his people, accomplishing his purpose. And he does this through his providence. He He's not taking men and making them do things, but God has this power and we can't explain it because that's on the divine side of things, not on our side. But God works these things out through history to bring about his will. And the same God that ruled during the days of Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel, the same God that ruled during the Persian Empire, the Greek Empire and the Roman Empire is the God who rules the world now. So regardless of what's going on, regardless of the turmoil and the chaos in the world around us, we know we can put our faith and confidence in him because he still rules and reigns today. So let us put our faith, our confidence in him and trust in him even now. Be thou my wisdom, be thou my true word. I ever with Thee, and Thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, and I Thy true Son. Thou in me dwelling, and I with Thee one. Be Thou my buckler, sword for the fight, be thou my dignity.